Nice. Night school. Night school. Back in the basement. We're shooting. Oh here. yeah, I forgot that we have to introduce that whole right. thing. Back here again. Uh, why? Sarah, my girlfriend's here. Why? Hi. Why um, are you? Hi, Sarah. I don't know. Do you want to say why? Uh, we did two episodes at uh, the new studio. Studio P. And then uh, they were like, are you guys going to get vaccinated? And we were like, nah, we're not. And then uh, they were like, well, some of the other people who record here might have a problem with it. And they were super nice about it. Like, they weren't being douchebags or anything. They're like, if you guys aren't vaccinated, you can't record here. Like, they were cool about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, Brian And there was, was some attempt to be, like, accommodating or, like, come up with a different way to do it. Yeah, they're like, could we set up another room or could we, like... And it wasn't even 100% certain that the other people who record there were going to have a problem with it. He was just saying, hey, there's a good chance this is going to come up, so mm -hmm. let's talk about it. So he addressed it as soon as he thought of it, yeah. like, which is great. And we were like, eh, nah, we're good. We'll just bounce. Yeah. Because we could have made it work, but we'd rather just have the freedom to do everything the way we want to do it. Totally. And not have to answer to anybody or... Yeah. Like, it was just an, it was just a, an inconvenience on top of <coughs> uh, feelings of, like, potentially having creative freedom issues. That, right. Like, combined with that made it feel like it's not really worth it. But because okay. they did, they did approach it a little bit in a way that was like, Travis, what exactly is your problem with vaccines? Which, and I don't have a problem with vaccines in general, but um, it's a fair question to ask. But, but it was kind of, uh, it was like saying, explain your reasoning to me on why yeah. you don't want a COVID vaccine so I can determine how reasonable it is. It felt kind of like that, sure. which was just a personal one-to-one -one conversation and was perfectly appropriate, but he has a right to ask. But he also doesn't because I mean anybody has the right to it's just say anybody can ask anybody mouth, anything. But yeah, yeah, anybody can ask anybody any question. But it was true. like, are you trying to gauge if I'm crazy or not? Because the deal yeah. was, I get to be as crazy as I want, and <laughs> right? you don't ask me any questions. Yeah, why are we now gauging how crazy I'm being? That wasn't part of the deal. Yeah, so we would rather have the freedom to just sit in our basement and uh, say sure. and do what we want. Yeah, yeah, works for me. So um, today, first episode back, we're going to do Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens by Dr. John E. Mack. Uh, this book, <clears throat> uh, I've had it for, I feel like a long time. I think I bought it at Barnes & Noble maybe a long time ago. But uh, this one came to my attention through Rogan, as many of them do, I guess. Yeah. But uh, Rogan had talked about how he read it years back in the 90s when he was doing that sitcom uh, news radio. When he was doing that, he read it and like he talks about how he had like... Is it some... when Rogan was doing that? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. yeah, he did he a... He was an actor on like a pretty popular TV show. I like really? watched it growing up with my parents. Huh. I've never seen it, but people say it's good. Cool. But he was on that and then did nothing for a while and then was on Fear Factor. Nice. But uh, he talked about how he had like some of his... The, the other actors on the show read this book and how they would come to it and be like, you're this is legitimately freaking me out. And he just talked about how scary it was and it sounded so interesting and it, it was so interesting and, and really like interesting in different ways and in different directions than I expected it to be. Sweet. So um, to talk a little bit about John Mack first. Uh, so John Mack, he was born in 1929 uh, he's an American doctor, a uh, psychiatrist. He got his doctorate from Harvard Medical School, and after grad, after becoming a doctor, he went into the Air Force. He was a medic captain in the Air Force for years. After that, he left, did uh, a psychiatric practice, so studied psychiatry. Uh, in particular, some of his focuses were in child psychology, uh, suicidal teenagers, heroin addiction. And one thing, according to Wikipedia, what he is mainly known for is his interest in worldview, meaning like how people's perception of the world affects their relationship with others mm. like that. Yeah. Uh, he was also very active during the 1980s as a like a uh, anti-nuclear war activist, because mm. uh, that was when the Cold War was going on with the Russians. Is that right? Yeah, that's the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh Evan just shrugs. You go, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I thought he said, I thought he nodded. It was like 50s to 80s. Long Isn't it war. kind of to now? No, I mean, no, I mean, 
mean, it pretty much ended in the 90s. Mm. But, I mean, you know, there's still tension in Russia now. Yeah, it's come back a little bit. Um, so in, uh, he then became he uh, he then became a professor at Harvard Medical School, so the same place that he got the degree from, and in 1977 won the Pulitzer Prize for writing uh, for writing a biography on T. E. Lawrence Lawrence of Arabia. I, I don't really know exactly what he did, but mm. famous guy, who, uh, British soldier who did a bunch of notable things in Arabia. Anyway, cool. he wrote a he wrote a biography on him and won a Pulitzer for it. Damn. That same year in 1977, he was made the head of Harvard Medical School. So he is the head of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, making him one of the most notable people in the psychiatric field. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's 1977. At that point, he's like late 40s. In, uh, in 1990, a friend of his, a woman he knows, told wanted to introduce him to a dude named Bud Hopkins. Uh, Bud Hopkins. That sounds so familiar. Um, he's, you've probably heard his name in, uh, different ufology related things that you've been exposed to. Cause he was, uh, one of the leading people in doing hypnotic regression on abductees, yeah. on people who said that they've had experiences and they feel like they were abducted by aliens or, uh, things adjacent to that. Like I remember waking up in the middle of the night and being paralyzed and seeing beings in the room. And then I don't remember anything after that. He was one of the, the people that was, uh, leading that charge, one of the first people to be using hypnotic regression to recover those memories in particular. And the woman, his friend explained to him who this person was and what he was doing. Uh, and John was immediately dismissive, like, well, it sounds like he found a bunch of kooks. Why, why should I care? He was immediately dismissive of that. And a few months later, she finally convinced him to meet with Bud Hopkins and, and start looking at some of the stuff that he's done. And I want to read one passage here. This is uh, from near the beginning of the book, explaining like what this whole thing, the impact that this ended up having on him. What the abduction phenomenon has led me, I would now say inevitably, to see is that we participate in a universe or universes that are filled with intelligences from which we have cut ourselves off, having lost the senses by which we might know them. It has become clear to me also that our restricted worldview or paradigm lies behind most of the major destructive patterns that threaten the human future. Mindless corporate acquisitiveness that perpetuates vast differences between rich and poor and contributes to hunger and disease. Ethno-national violence resulting in mass killing, which, would grow, which could grow into a nuclear holocaust. And ecological destruction on a scale that threatens the survival of the Earth's living systems. There are, of course, other phenomena <clears throat> that have led to the challenging of the prevailing materialist slash dualistic worldview. These include near-death experiences, meditation practices, the use of psychedelic substances, shamanic journeys, ecstatic dancing, religious rituals, and other practices that open our being to what we call in the West non-ordinary states of consciousness. But none of these, I believe, speaks to us so powerfully in the language that we know best, the language of the physical world. For the abduction phenomenon reaches us, so to speak, where we live. It enters harshly into the physical world, whether or not it is of this world. Its power, therefore, to reach and alter our consciousness is potentially immense. Wow. So this is a guy who, at 60 years old, didn't believe in aliens, thought that yeah. anybody that said they were abducted by aliens is a kook. And that's what he has to say when he's 64, when he writes this book. Wow. Yeah. So he's saying that there's a difference between being aware of transcendent states of consciousness and alternate realities in theory and accepting the idea that real living things that could directly impact us could move from those places to this one that we're in physically right now, that that's like accepting a truth like that makes you, I don't know, more directly in that yeah. transcendent world rather than just thinking in theory that that transcendent world is out there somewhere. Right. Because right. those other things that he's mentioning are sort of like rituals or, or things that you could do in order to become aware that something weird's going on, that there's more going on right. besides the material. Yeah. And what he's saying is that this is like the abduction phenomenon is like that coming into the physical world and shaking you and right. saying like, hey, something weird's going on right. and you can't look away from it. Yeah. So that's how he ended up feeling after all of this. So in, in 1990, he, he meets with Bud Hopkins, 
and uh, Bud Hopkins starts explaining to him what he's been up to. And uh, for years, he had been using uh, hypnotic regression to get memories back from people that claimed they were abducted. He had done this on hundreds of people. So John is seeing all the evidence that he has, all the case studies that he has. Yeah. He's done this on hundreds of patients. Uh, they all have very similar stories about, like, what the things look like, what the creatures look like, what kind of, how they move, how what kind of transportation they use, what they do when they abduct you. Uh, people that had no idea who each other, of course, these people don't know each other, yet they're all reporting, like, the exact same stories to Bud about what it is that's going on when they get abducted. Wow. Uh, they have similar markings. Uh, there's commonly what's referred to as like a scoop mark in people when they end up getting abducted, like a like a little divot in the skin huh. where they're like doing some sort of sample, like some sort of tissue sample. And that seems to be like a consistent marking that people have. Um, there's even cases of like actually finding physical hardware in people, uh, trackers or things like that. Who knows what they are exactly, but implants they're putting different and there's different kind of implants that they're that they're fi but is finding in people like there's consistency in that so he shows uh, all this evidence um all the consistent stories to john and uh john he john does seem interested and so bud invites him to start coming to some meetings because uh bud is basically like he's doing like support group meetings for abductees for people that have had these experiences kind of a safe place where someone reputable believes them and I mean, not just that, but somebody who be believes them because it happened to them too. Like there, there's other people there that have also had it right, happen. Right, so it's right. good to have somebody like, even if in theory I could say I believe you, I don't. I wasn't there though. I didn't. I didn't see them, so I can't yeah. really talk to you about it. The and same way. And I also way. can't possibly a hundred percent believe you. I mostly right. believe you. I lean towards thinking that what you're saying is true, but I. Yeah, like I can't one hundred percent. Even though I strongly yeah. believe in aliens and abductions, I not there's so many little ways that it could not be exactly as right. you say it is. Even right. if I don't think you're lying to me, and you could be lying to me and not know you're lying. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. So, so John gets invited to some of these um, these groups that Bud is doing, and so he ends up talking to many of these abductees. Uh, and he gets increasingly more interested because the evidence is such that he can't look away from it. Uh, a few months after he meets Bud, Bud starts referring patients in the Boston area, which is where uh, John lives at the time, to John, to his psychiatric practice. And John accepts and he starts seeing patients. So he spends the next four years doing the research that would end up being this book about the phenomenon. Wow. And uh, I just thought it was so fascinating that, like... I'm scared, bro. He had, yeah. He had no idea about this. And then he goes in. He's instantly obsessed. And he spends four years doing this. This is overwhelming information. Yeah. He so, hasn't even said anything that's happened yet. Yeah. Right. So, he sees... He um, when he, he tell, tells a little bit about, like, the patients that he saw for this. Uh, he saw over 100 patients for this. 49 of which he did extensive, hyp or not necessarily extensive, but he did hypnotism on. He did hypnotic regression on them in order to, um, and sometimes, sometimes it was just so one John session. So John learned it too? Uh, John is qualified to do it. Bud is not a psychiatrist, and he, in, in order to remain, make sure that he didn't get, to remain um, professional and make sure that everything looks above board. He was not doing hypnotism himself. He was a painter who became interested in it. And he started, he organized these things with certain hypnotists that didn't even necessarily believe in the alien abduction phenomenon. Right. With, I like that. Yeah. With abductees. So then he's like, then he is, he is sort of guiding the situation, but they have control of ending this if they feel it's being inappropriate or, or anything like that. Right. Um, he is the uh, head of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and is very familiar with hypnotism. And when he when he does the hypnotic regression, uh, it is it is based primarily on a hypnotic regression technique developed by Stan and Christina Groff. Wow. Uh, who wrote Spiritual Emergency? Or no, no, no. They wrote some of the essays in it. Yeah, they wrote a couple. What do you and know of them? Do you know anything else besides them? No, no, that's okay. it. But. What an incredible book. Yeah. Yeah. Co collection of essays about 
uh, mental health crises and their overlap with like um, documented spiritual events like mm-hmm. the shamanic initiation where people go crazy for a period of time and gain healing yep. abilities <laughs> as a result of it. Um, like yoga stuff like uh, what's it Kundalini experiences mm-hmm. and how they psychologically affect people and uh, so yeah they put together that collection of essays and wrote a couple and you got like Rob Doss and other dudes like that in there too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. great book um, but yeah he got the hypnotic regression technique from them although he's combined it with some other things he said that uh, deep rapid breaths are involved uh, there's a certain music that is best to use as well as uh, drawing mandalas, which I don't know a lot about that. Me neither. Uh, but yeah, draws drawing mandalas. I don't. I don't know how exactly that's done. Um, he tells them to imagine a comfortable place to return to, and so this is like a place mentally that they can return to if they get uncomfortable with uh, the hypnotic regression. Because when you recover these memories, you basically experience them again. Like you, wow. you like, and that makes sense. Cause like, if you're, re- imagine remembering a memory you don't remember, that would be the same as it happening to you. Yeah. Because you don't. Seems like it. Yeah. And so this, he reminds them that they have this place that if they need to leave that reality at any time, they can, and they can come back to this comfortable place that they've made in their head. Yeah. Uh, he will um sort of sometimes there will be like a specific incident that he's going to want to get to the bottom of like uh remember when you were think of that night when you were 12 and you were camping or or whatever uh, and he'll like bring them back to that point and then have them walk through how did that night go even the parts that you can't remember uh and then sometimes it'll be more open like uh just let your consciousness go where it's going to go and that doesn't even necessarily always go to abduction related things um but there's different ways that he would go about it depending on what that person was uh, wanting to sort out exactly at the time, because these people have all kinds of different problems that, that they feel like are happening because of the abduction phenomenon. Oh, okay. And so, so they're not just being hypnotized for research purposes. It's also therapeutic for them. It's primarily therapeutic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's primarily about trying to get to the bottom of this for the sake of, of these people. Nice. And these are all people, these are not like, these are all people that are coming to him because they're like, as much as I, as much as this makes me uncomfortable, I heard about you or I heard about Bud Hopkins. Yeah. And as much as I would like to look away from this, like, I can't stop thinking about it. So I need to try and figure out if I'm crazy or if I'm not, then what does that mean? And like, yeah. what happened exactly? Yeah. So um, it is primarily about that. Um, and one thing that I think is, that was really interesting, this, I wasn't even going to go into this, but like one thing that was brought up is that he actually got sued after this, uh, after this book, there was a, a hearing to get him, uh, I don't know, I don't know the word, but disbarred for, for, I don't know what that is for a doctor, but like to get his license taken away Wow. because he was, uh, it is ridiculous that he's in, that he's, uh, like considering the delusions of these people and sort of reinforcing their delusions uh, by uh, by saying that it is possible that you were abducted by aliens and they tried to get his license taken away and it, it didn't end up working. Oh, that's good. Uh, but, that's good. Yeah, I see how somebody could feel justified making that case though. Yeah. Fuck this guy. Yeah, man. This guy's really... a loon. He's making these crazy people worse. <laughs> right. That's yeah, it's kind of reasonable to see it that way. Yeah. So he'll do these, um, he'll have them remember as much as they're comfortable with and as when they feel too tired, because it's, um, he talks about the fact that this is like an incredibly emotional experience because this is like, he said he's never felt such emotion in psychiatric uh, meetings with people than he has with these because these people will be like in a chair screaming. They'll be like screaming about what's going on to them and like yelling what they yelled at the aliens at the time. And wow. they're then they're like experiencing in that moment. And he's there in the room, kind of trying to talk them through it. But it's a very intense thing. And if, when they've gone as far as they're comfortable getting, uh, they get pulled back, and then they discuss uh, and they talk about like what do you think that means, and they they go into all that. Uh, they they always end up following up a week or two later. Him or his assistant will call and like sort of break down like how have you been feeling since then? If they don't call already, which they typically do, it sounds like yeah. And then he also would end up organizing uh, sort of uh, support groups of people 
and even encourage them to like, and don't even involve me and like start doing support groups separate. Like he just wants to make these people friends so that they have someone to talk to right. about these things. Okay. So that's sort of the, the process that he would go through with this. So I'm going to start describing like sort of the stuff that actually happens. So when a, when an abduction experience starts, uh, it can happen in a few different ways. In bed seems like the most common way which makes a lot of sense. That's the, it's, when people are asleep, that's the sneakiest time to go do something like that. Yeah. Um, oftentimes a blue or white light, a buzz or a hum will end up filling the room. Uh, and then they will feel intense anxiety. Uh, sleep paralysis typically happens when these, when these people are like, when they wake up, they'll wake up and they may see, even see the things in the room or they may just see the ship outside a window or something like that, but they'll see creatures in the room with them they'll feel anxiety and they won't be able to move. And that is often like about where the memory goes out for people. Yeah. Um, the beings, the, the abductors seem to be able to turn off other people. Like the, if, a if someone is getting abducted and their spouse is in the bed next to them, the spouse won't wake up. Even if the yelling, like even if you're yelling, the spouse won't wake up because they have some sort of uh, mental dampening technology to like keep the person unconscious that's terrifying yeah yeah and there's nothing they can, there's nothing they can do about it it seems uh they seem to be just totally able to like turn almost anybody off um it may also happen while driving they're they're driving or walking there are many stories of people that'll be like walking or driving and then they'll have some sort of a sense to like i want to go they're like i just feel like going for a drive or like i want to walk off this way i don't usually walk off into the woods like this but it just sounds like fun they just have a feeling that they can't even describe they're like i just felt like it i just felt like going for a walk there and then it happened and then like they end up abducted they wow. end up, something ends up meeting them where so they almost the abductors seem to have the ability to get people to go to a certain location without even understanding why they're going there yeah. for a pickup the so the person will end up being paralyzed uh there will almost always be a being there with them and then most people use the word they are floated to the ship from there uh so it's very much like the typical tractor beam description there is people describe like a a beam ramp uh that something they feel themselves pulled up towards the ship they go through walls consistently people describe that like it, it, you can go through walls the, the you feel like a, as you go through the wall you feel like a vibration through all of you but you go through and they tell you to like the being that's with you will tell you to like relax or whatever i don't know what that means exactly yeah but like i don't know if that employs like the idea of there being like a bunch of space in like in every atom like if you're if space can pass through space if you align it right i don't know what but they're able to move people like that um they end up being brought into a ship uh and they end up in they will go through like a, a port either like a either something on the bottom or like an oval on the side of the ship they'll be brought in through a port and they end up in uh basically a, a foyer like a, a dark room what's a foyer a foyer like the entrance to a house okay the entrance room uh they are people very consistently describe that the first ship after that point then gets pulled up to a second ship that is much higher up. So a mothership situation. Yeah. So there's a mothership way up to where we can't see it. They send a ship down, it gets the person and then the ship comes back up with the person. So there's, um, there's differences. People of all ages get abducted. Little kids get abducted and old people get abducted. And uh, the, the beings treat, children and adults differently. They don't treat us as though we're all like the exact same thing. They are sensitive to that. The, when adults get brought up, it is uh, typically a very medical thing. That is usually what it is. Uh, they'll be brought up. They'll typically be stripped naked. Either the beings will actually like take their clothes off or they'll just force you to, or you'll be unconscious and you'll just wake up and you're, you're naked. They, uh, people get put into a chair. One guy described it as like the most comfortable chair or operating table that's ever been developed because it basically like completely shapes to the contour of your body huh. so that it's, uh, extremely comfortable because I guess it would evenly distribute weight 
perfectly throughout the whole table or whatever. Mm. They'll be put onto the table. Uh, physicals happen. So they'll do general physical testing, uh, the same kind of things that a doctor would do. Um, there is, like, anal probes happen quite a bit. They'll put, like, uh, <laughs> put, like a, a thing up people's up people's anus, and uh, one guy describes that it went up, it, like, impossibly far into him, that, like, they just kept pushing it up, which means that it's probably something like a snake, like a plumber's snake, but it is much uh, more gentle and much capable of going much longer than that. Wow. So they have very interesting medical technology. So it doesn't physically hurt people? Uh, the anal probe? Yeah. Um, I mean, people, I don't... I don't know that, I think that he was numbed, uh, and there is stories of, like, when, if they started feeling pain during an operation, they will either be touched, or looked at, or a thing will be pointed at them, and their pain goes away. Like, they have various ways of removing pain from people. Well, it's, uh, oddly humane. (laughs) Yeah. There are some things about it that is oddly humane. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, and they do seem to have... Uh, extremely powerful control over our minds, including our pain receptors. And, uh, they, so they can turn off our pain. They can turn off our fear. They'll like, they'll even like make people feel less afraid. Um, the room that they'll be brought in, where these operations happen, is typically uh, it's typically like a single room. There's just the one bed there. Uh, but around the along some of the walls, there will be TVs uh, or some kind of screens. There will be uh, multiple aliens in the room, typically, and uh, they'll be doing very. They'll be going around to various gauges and screens and doing what you'd imagine people on a ship would be doing, like that. Um, there's typically a leader, like the main doctor, that's doing the operation, and uh, the the beings themselves are. Well, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, so the beings are running around in the room working on various technologies. Uh, the room is typically white. They will be, there are descriptions that, um, sometimes they will cut into people. Like a guy describes that, like he had his, his leg was out and he saw them sort of cut his leg open, peel it open and like look inside and look at some of the mechanisms, but he wasn't feeling the pain because they had, they had him completely numbed, but they, Um, they then closed him back up and they used a technology that several people describe that is like a, like a, something like a laser pen. Like I've seen things like this in sci-fi, something like a laser pen that, and they just kind of like instantly heals them. So they flip it back together and then just sort of heal over it like super glue or whatever. And they won't even have a scar. Oh, that's what I was going to say. It doesn't leave a scar. <laughs> no, it typically does not leave a scar. Their technology seems very good at healing. Um, and uh, the main thing, well, oh, there's also the chips, of course. So they're they're putting, like, they do seem to be putting chips in people, or, like, I don't know if they're trackers. I don't know what kind of implants they all are exactly. Um, but I've seen, like, documentaries that, like, show some of these little devices. Uh, people with abduction experiences consistently have devices that are implanted into them, and they don't even know. Sometimes they don't even know where they are exactly. So I imagine a lot of the people that, like, you hear kind of, I don't even know that I've ever heard anyone say this, but it's just been like a cliche that I've heard mocked about conspiracy theorists. Like, people talking about, like, they're putting a chip in my brain, man. Yeah. Like, that's kind of a thing. Like, yeah. The, the greys are, there are aliens that are putting chips in people, either for tracking uh, potentially they're even supplemental. They're potentially, they're like to supplement some sort of growth in them or whatever. The ones that like, you know, you, like you've seen documentaries on and stuff, where are those chips like found? Do we know like where some have been found in people? They're kind of all over. It seems like I've, I've heard legs, I've heard hands, I've heard. No discernible. I feel like, like a, yeah, there's, rhythm. I haven't heard any consistency to the location of yeah. them. No. That's weird. Uh, Besides vagina, I guess. Really? Yeah. Um, which leads me to the next thing, and what seems to be one of the two main things that they are interested in. Uh, most of the testing that they that they do involves reproductive systems. Wow. So 
Um, they typically, when if they take an adult male, they're typically taking a sperm sample. They're typically like hooking them up to some kind of machine. Sometimes it involves electrical impulses. Sometimes it involves an alien that is super hot. That is like, that is like meant to titillate no them. Yeah. <laughs> and in the state that they're in at the time, they're like on board with it. They're like, yeah, yeah. this is good. Or they'll do that. Like there's one description of like a teenage boy in particular who was like, hell yeah. And he's like embarrassed about it now and rep like talking about it. Yeah. But at the time he was like, I just thought it was, it was awesome. Because they um, can just turn off your inhibition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. They can make you feel very comfortable. Uh, so they're, they're typically taking, uh, is that cheating? What? <laughs> is I, it, I, oh, is it cheating? I wouldn't <laughs> consider it cheating. <laughs> There was, you know, interestingly, though, there ha there were, like, a couple of cases in here where the person needed to, like, explain, like, one in one case to their wife, in one case to their husband, that, like, they had done something sexual with an alien, and they were, like, they were, like, scared to have to address that yeah. with them. Uh, so, yeah, that is very real. Yeah. Um, with women, they are often, like, they are often putting different... Uh, implements up the vagina and taking things um, and putting things in. One thing they seem to be doing is they, they seem to be even taking sperm from some people, taking and they're taking eggs from women as well. They're taking eggs from women, they're taking some things out of women, putting some things into women. They are fertilizing eggs and then planting it in women. They're fertilizing it with other sperm and putting them into women and having them grow in the women for different amounts of time sometimes two terms sometimes it just they just let it go uh, but in a lot of cases they are taking the babies they are like implanting babies into women Whoa. letting the babies grow in the woman for a certain period of time sometimes usually just like a few months and then they take her back they take the uh embryo out of her they do what they're going to do with it and then they put her back, and she thinks she had a miscarriage. Like, Jeez. that is, like, in, I, this leads me to believe that... Oh, so they put them back on Earth. Yeah. And, now and they let, let the baby grow in them for a couple months, and then they abduct them again. Yeah. And then they take the baby out of them, and they incubate Jesus. it their own way, and they put the woman back, and then... She, just, she's, she got pregnant and had a miscarriage. Yeah. Holy shit. So in some cases where women are having miscarriages... This is what's happening. Probably an extremely small amount. I don't know, but some. A non-zero amount. Not zero. If, if, it doesn't uh, sound if like we're it's to zero. believe this, it's not zero. Um, it gets weirder. The, um, sometimes, well, sometimes the adults will be brought, as part of their abduction experience, they will be brought into a room... And on the room, there is, like, it's like, uh, it's kind of like the fish section at a PetSmart. Glass, gla like glass tubes, or like, um, like Buzz Lightyear toys in a, in a plastic box, like, standing here like this. Uh, babies. In, in all of the tubes. But they're, they're hybrid. Um, so they are not human or alien. They are doing some sort of hybridization of humans and the aliens and themselves. And they are putting them in these tubes that are on the wall. Sometimes uh, the adults will be brought a baby and shown it. And, and they'll say, this is your baby. And they'll like want the person to hold the baby and love the baby. That like in future abductions, if they, if they end up making a baby from that person's material... In future abductions, they will often give the baby to the person and say, this is your baby, we need you to love it. And so then they love the baby, and the babies seem like, the babies, the word that was used often was listless. Like, they're just kind of, they're like kind of checked out, they're not like totally present. But they're, the aliens tell them, this is your baby, and love it, and then they say, like, we're going to take it back, though. Sometimes they will be brought into rooms where there are lots of children hybrids um alien human hybrids in these rooms in like playrooms where 
sort of listless, like barely, like not emotional children sort of stand around kind of attempting to play. And so they'll see like these sort of odd children that one person said have their their own sort of vigor, although they are not like physically vigorous at all. That seems to be the hybridization program seems to be like pretty close to the core of what they're doing. Um, they tell people that they are interested in us for our emotions and for something about something about how primal we are or something like that, whereas they themselves are much wiser, but more detached, but more they're like more detached emotionally, but more connected universally or something like that. Uh, um, several people are told that there is that we have a common ancestor that like we are at some level, we have a common ancestor with the aliens and us. If you go back far enough, we're kind of the same being. Wow. And we are able to, in to interbreed and they are, they are doing interbreeding because they think they can make like a better person through combining uh, certain of them, certain of us. And probably of them means a lot more than one race. It probably means that they've done hybridization before. Whatever they are now, if they're doing a hybridization project here, yeah. it's likely that whatever they are is already the result of a broader hybridization program. I don't see. I don't see why I assume that. Like it definitely seems possible. Yeah. If the other one is possible. Yeah, you shouldn't assume it, but I guess it seems entirely plausible and. It's kind of like if they're super, they could be any age. We have no reason to think that they're young at all. Right. And if they've lived a very long time, then it's likely that we're not the first times they've been interested in, in hybridization. Yeah. So um, people, they are using certain genetic material from humans and certain genetic material from others. And then they are combining them in an attempt to make a better version of people. So, at, w at what point does uh, the alien get involved? You know, like, are, is there, like, yeah. alien sperm? Or is that what they're using those, like, three-month-old fetuses for? And then that's when they're, like, injecting their DNA. Like, like what like, is the genetic material that comes from the being, from yeah. the, the abductors? Yeah. I don't know. Because uh, I, don't, I don't have any reason to think they have genitals. Uh, there's like no report of them, right. well, except for like the sort of uh, I'm like ones. a hot alien, yeah, the like yeah. the sex aliens. But besides the sex aliens, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like they typically have genitals. Although it does seem like they're not they're not robots. It seems like they do have some level of fear, yeah. or that they like they are biological in some way, not just mechanical. Um, but I don't know. I don't know exactly what they are what they are inserting from themselves. Um, I would imagine it would be like probably not sperm and probably something just, some just more DNA some based yeah, thing DNA into the fetus or something. Maybe something the like fetus that. has to be a certain age before they can combine it. Yeah, and that's why they're growing the fetuses for you know a while. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so that uh, that seems to be a big part of what they're doing. Um, the the beings themselves, uh, there's of course variance in the way that they're described by the the different cases in this book. Although most of them are exactly the thing that you think they are, um, they're the same kind of gray description that we see most places. Yeah. Um, so they've got no ears. They've got a tiny mouth. They've got a bigger head than we've got. They're gray. They're three to four feet tall. Uh, instead of having a nose, they just have two small holes where the nose would be. They have a uh, thin, longer than, longer than we would have limbs. Uh, they're typically described as wearing a skin tight bodysuit, usually like just the same tone as what seems to be their body. Although it could all be kind of the same thing. I don't know. It could be like a full body suit. Um, like over the head as well. I don't know. Uh, they're often described wearing boots of some kind. Uh, in some in some cases, they're wearing hoods over their head. Huh. 
the eyes are the thing that's typically talked about the most. Um, they've got huge black eyes and people say that their eyes have power and that like they'll often end up sort of looking away from the eyes because when they look into the eyes, they the, like they say it's like the person, the alien goes into them, goes into their thoughts and gains further control of them when they look in their eyes. Jeez. And so, although people will describe being scared by the eyes because the eyes seem to have so much power over them yet when they end up looking into them they end up feeling like more comfortable because the beings are able to calm them down through the connection with the eyes uh some people have said that it doesn't seem to them that the eyes are the eyes that the eyes are lenses and that behind the eyes they can see that there are eyes that it's like tinted glass and that if that they can see through it and then on the other side there are real biological eyeballs huh um that was something a, a couple people said uh there and then there is oftentimes a, a leader who is about a foot taller so four to five feet tall and that's an oddly that's oddly a, a an oddly consistent description that i've even heard other cases before this book that like there'll be a doctor among them and this doctor is taller than the rest of them, and he seems to be in charge, and it's not clear why he's taller, uh, but they often feel like he's the one that's in control, and um, in many cases feel like they know him, that like they've known him all their life. Because these people that end up getting abducted, they're not abducted once, they're almost always abducted throughout their life, like they're a, wow. a subject that's being tracked. And so they'll end up having a relationship with the doctor that is the lead on their case. So they'll often feel like they know him. Sometimes they even say that they know his name and there are like a couple of examples of names given. They typically feel favorable about the leaders and doctors. Like, like they're comfortable. At least I recognize this dude. Or are they like, this guy terrorized me. Like this is a yeah. bad figure. I would say that's kind of neutral. Um, I think typically in the moment they feel mostly discomfort because they are like, they're, you know, paralyzed on a table yeah. on an alien ship, but they just often feel like they know him. And in some cases, like, like he loves them. But in, uh, it seems like in more than half of the cases, they do feel like they've met him before. Um, and then just in some of the cases, they feel like there's actually a loving connection between the two of them. Mm. The, um, the uh, so yeah, um, oftentimes they'll the the eye the eyes. I touched on that that like the when they, when people feel like the people feel like they can get stared at extra hard, and then the aliens can take further control over them by looking more deeply into them somehow. Even though that doesn't physically make sense, that's what it feels like to them. Uh, they feel that their mind is searched by the beings. That the beings when they when they make a strong connection with them, they have full access to your mind and everything about you and they will look through all of you and they feel like they are while they are getting a physical exam they are also getting a mental exam that searches mm -hmm. their thoughts mm -hmm. um sometimes uh, these operations don't happen in rooms that are like single rooms like i described uh sometimes it's more like a like a a, a big room with tons of abductees or and it'll there may even there may be oper there are like operation rooms that are big group operation rooms like that, uh, but there are also rooms where they're sort of taught or told to just like mingle. Here's more of you, like they're brought to a room and told that like these are other people in a similar situation to you, and they're told to just sort of mingle among them. One person reported being told by uh, the gray that had abducted him that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of you. That was the, that was one number that one guy got is that there are hundreds of thousands of people that uh, are in a situation like this with uh, with those beings. Do you huh. think that it's like um, manipulation of time while they're up there, or is just like massive abductions? Uh, yeah, I, I do think they're capable of time manipulation. It, because uh, just like a hundred, like they had a hundred thousand people at once. Uh, uh, people are probably. Like, maybe somebody's been there for years, but then they're returned back to, like, the night they were abducted, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know? Like, yeah. Like, passes differently, right? 
it, yeah. So to clarify, the I, I didn't mean she she didn't mean that there are hundreds of thousands there or like currently in that room uh, or like currently abducted. Just that there are like a hundred thousand or there are hundreds of thousands of people that are getting abducted, oh, like okay. open cases, okay. something like that. Um, although I, there is reason to believe that like yeah, the time stuff isn't right. Like people will be gone longer than they were gone. Okay. Yeah. They're often shown their babies, uh, the child care rooms, calming tools. Okay. And then the other thing that they end up, uh, the, the other very consistent thing that seems to be a part of the, the project that these aliens are doing um, involves warning us about apocalypse. They will be, people, abductees will typically be shown uh, apocalyptic imagery, like uh, meteors, nuclear warfare, like the world in chaos, the world in disarray, the world after it's destroyed. Um, they're told that either through, either it's psychic imagery that is put into their head, because um, the aliens do seem to be able to psychically communicate thoughts into people's head, besides just being able to search thoughts. Um, and they can, it seems like, broadcast images into people's head, which I guess that's just a thought. Uh, but they also have screens, and so in some cases it's just done on a screen. But mm. people are almost always shown images of apocalypse, and the beings will explain to them that what we are doing, that the way we're treating our planet is, like, can't keep going like this, and that we're going to destroy the planet, we're almost out of time. And they are, they want this person to understand that, and to be... Uh, trying to avoid that future through whatever means they can. So it's like they're trying to get the abductee to try and convince the rest of their people, humans, to correct the error of our ways on Earth to stop us from destroying our planet, which they think is almost certainly going to happen. It seems like they are they are not that hopeful about it. And that is where the hybridization program comes in. Is the hybridization program? It seems like is is uh, you know it's. And I'm sure it would be useful otherwise. But one of the reasons that they're doing it is they want to create a bunch of hybrid people so that if we destroy the world, they can repopulate it. Um, one person said that they that the way that that was depicted to them was like uh, the world's going to get destroyed. Some regular people will live, and then we're going to throw a bunch of hybrid people into. Uh, and the regular people may need to lead the hybrid people for some time, but we're going to put, we're going to repopulate the earth with hybrid people with the rest of the naturally, the natural humans. And then uh, that's what we're going to do just in case you guys end up fucking it up. Like it looks like you're about to. Mm -hmm. They're also not completely. Why hopeless. do they care to keep the earth populated? Right. Um, I think the answer they would give is because they love us. Or is this part of some like outreach program? To yeah, help, uh, you're like a global or like an interstellar <laughs> big brother to like help species that are gonna go extinct. <laughs> we're an at risk species. Yeah, like our planet they popped think we're... up and they had to send help. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what they say, what they tell us, uh, what they tell us humans is that they're here because they're worried about us and they want to stop us from making the mistake that it looks like we're about to make because we don't have the wisdom to see where this is going, but Damn. but we're on our way to destruction. We're on our way to apocalypse, and they're going to try and avoid that, but they're also making a plan B in case we do end up destroying it, which they expect. But they clearly haven't given up because they're continuing to abduct people and try to explain this to them. That like, right. hey, you got to think about this. you got to think about what you're doing. Yeah, apocalypse images. They tell the adults, hey... <laughs> The world's about to end if you guys don't get your act together. But if you don't, that's all right. We'll put different kinds of people here and we'll try again. Uh, the the kids, when they get abducted, uh, the kids' situation is a little bit different. Uh, interestingly, they are kinder. Uh, they're less invasive. They're less traumatic experiences. They're more fun experiences for kids. Um, and it seems like, and maybe all of what's going on with the kid stuff is that they are uh, all the kid abductions are just meant to be a comforting introduction to the abductors to make them feel more uh, comfortable with what they're going to have to do further along in that being's lifetime. Yeah. It might be that's what it is. Um, when they take the kids, though, uh, the kids, 
when they get abducted, it's it's much more often like uh, they got the urge to wander off, like a, to wander off the playground, off into the woods or whatever, and then they see the thing, and it's like, hello, come here, and they like feel comfortable, and they go with them, and then they go up to a spaceship with them, and it's a, a play date for the most part. Uh, for the most part, they're just sort of like, wow, they're playing with other kids. They have like other kids there. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, specific examples of this, uh, but they do do psychic testing on kids. Uh, really? in, they're interested in like how, uh, how much ESP potential they have. Yeah, something wow. like that. Um, one thing one thing that was described along those lines is there was a like a kind of drone that was that had a remote control, but the remote control was meant to be a channel for your thoughts, and it controlled the drone flying around the room. And one uh, one woman who was, I believe, seven when this when this happened to her, but she was like in a room with like ten older kids, and they were taking turns, and uh, she did the best of anyone, and she remembers how proud she felt of like because wow. the the uh, the person the woman that the woman the female alien that was running the test was like very impressed with her and was like, you did a very good job. But let's take that from you. You're going to make the big kids feel better. She's like doing that. And it's like an oddly like kind human right. interaction. So there are like, people can tell the difference between like male and female aliens. Good, I know you talked about yeah. the sexy aliens, but yeah, good question. Um, that, that was addressed the, yes, people can consistently tell whether that's a, a male or female. And they don't know why. They said it's just like something intuitive that they know. It's like a psychic knowing that they have when they're around these beings. Whether they've got like what kind of energy Interesting. they have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these kids, they go up for a play date. They'll end up playing with other abductees. Uh, they'll be brought into rooms full of hybrid kids and told to play with the hybrid kids. Because they want to try and the, the beings are trying to teach the hybrid kids how to be playful. And so they bring, they want to bring emotional humans around them to try and make them more human. I guess to push them more towards emotion, maybe. Um, so they'll, which is like why the adults end up like, they want to hold and love the hybrid babies that are partly based on their genetics. And the kids right. will, will hang out with the hybrids. I wonder how often it's like uh, someone they're related to even, like uh like a, a hybrid that they've got a, a relation to. So uh, yeah. I guess to give some background on that, um, there's clear like lineage to this. Like there's, uh, it's very family based um, in particular mothers and daughters, like mothers will end up being abductees as a kid. And they'll remember these experiences throughout their life. And then when they have kids, they stop having those experiences and their daughter starts having those experiences instead. Wow. And, um, That's wild. That is so weird. Which makes a kind of sense if they're if they're interested in genetics. They're inter they have some interest in genetics and uh, and with reproduction, and so they're doing some sort of testing that involves like okay, we'll see over generations what happens if we input so much of whatever D whatever DNA. Um, yeah, it is possible that there are like people. It is possible that hybrids live among us, that hybrids that are very close to human live among us and like look like us and, and behave like we do. Uh, there was one guy who, and, and he's not alone in this, although he was like the, the best example of it in the book, who after this whole experience, after going through the hypnotic regression, he came to remember that like not only did he agree to this, he is one of the aliens and that this is an avatar esque situation, James Cameron avatar where they're being put into a human like body, their consciousness. They can, they can put their consciousness into a human body, which is like even a dangerous thing. It's kind of like a scary thing for them to do. Like, all right, I'm going to go into a human body. I don't know how lost I'll get. I don't know exactly what's going to happen to me when I become <laughs> physical and have to deal with like, being a completely physical person. So weird. That is crazy. <laughs> so they come live in a human body and then they end up getting abducted and, and through the abduction experience, whenever they're there, they remember that that's where they're from. When they're there, they remember like, oh, this is my home. 
One guy even said that he had a separate body that he could access when he was on the ship. That as he was an undercover uh, abductor, and he was in this human body, but when they took him to the ship, they would put him into, he would his consciousness would shift into his real, realer Alien body, body yeah. that he was using before this. So, um, and he said that, the, and uh, John said that that is a very common thing that people end up coming to believe, that like, Many of them, like many of them, come to believe that they agreed to this off the bat. That they agreed to this, and they didn't even remember agreeing to it. But like, oh right, I remember. This is like something I agreed to. But uh, some of them will even think that like, not only did I agree to it, I am an alien, and this human form is a goof, and I am involved in this project, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to save the human. Like I'm, I've taken on human body to attempt to save the humans in my way. I've gone undercover to try and save them. That's crazy. Yeah. We, like, any of the people like that, uh, I'm curious, like, what they've done with that life if they've ended up, you know, helping or hurting the human race in any way. Sure, yeah. Um, That's so, a good point. I didn't think of the fact that they could make it worse. <laughs> like, like, if they, they get so deep what in. Yeah. What sure. What? Yeah. What if what? Like, Hitler. Like, people that end up having, like, crazy thoughts. <laughs> they just don't even know, like, how to do with these emotions, because yeah. they're not used to emotions. Right, that's yeah. why I'm wondering if they... I mean, I'm sure that's why they're observing them, just to measure that, but I guess I'm just curious what the number is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much it's helping or hurting. Yeah. Um, so, through... Like, many of the people especially after hypnotic regression, because most of these people come not knowing what happened to them. And mm -hmm. so this guy that like is an undercover alien, uh, he's now believes he didn't go there believing he was an undercover alien. He be right. he went there thinking he was abducted, but he couldn't remember what the fuck happened. And then afterwards ended up realizing, Oh, I'm, I'm an undercover alien. And it is a, what, what was, what I think was like the craziest thing about this book is that, all of these people, after going through the hypnotic regression and remembering everything, the more they remember and the, the more they rehash and the more they like can piece together what is it that was going on, the more they come to believe that like, oh, this is good. Like, I'm glad I'm involved in this. I'm happy to be involved in this. And their future abductions, if they have them, end up going more smoothly because they're not afraid and they can remember more of it. And wow. through like a lack of fear, they have a better relationship with the beings. So they're treated with more respect there. And like, as they start to realize like, oh, you guys aren't, the... as they remember, they realize, or they come to believe that these things are not the bad guys. That they're here to help us. Wow. And they end up being, at least in terms of the examples that were given here, universally think that they were good. That they were good experiences and that these people really are here to help us. Wow. Um, and many of those people do end up being involved in like environmental causes, things like that. Like they do end up through remembering that like the reason that they're here, they do end up sort of giving up more of their old life and like turning more to spirituality and turning more to, uh, like economic or not economic, uh, like, uh, environmental? environmental. Yeah. Uh, activism. Wow. So they do end up becoming like more helpful once once they remember so this like hypnotherapy yeah. is uh, really helping the cause <laughs> right because their 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 worldviews are constructed in such a way that this new data that they got from these aliens doesn't fit into it so as soon as they return to their bodies they no longer even have access mm -hmm. to that like they sure they with the, the hypnosis i'm spitballing i don't know anything about hypnosis but it seems like it allows you to access a part of your brain that you don't normally have access to because it doesn't fit in your paradigm of the world. And so through this hypnosis, they're able to build this bridge between the world as they've construed it mm -hmm. and this information that, that lies far beyond their understanding. And that if that's, if that's the case, that would illuminate them. Yeah. Because it would give them greater access to – it would give them – access to truths that were previously too big to stomach right and it, yeah it so expand like, their paradigm yeah. and uh he was alluding to something like that at the beginning of the book saying like 
this is transcendent, this is alternative universe level shit directly infiltrating your little three dimensional reality and you can't ignore it. You know, he was saying like that might be one of the most spiritually transformative things that we could encounter. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the 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 information that they're given by the abductors is so big that yeah, it doesn't like fit for them. It's like it's too much information to take in at the rate that they give it to us. Something like that. That's not what I was saying. But I, I see yeah. how it could be that too. But then and then the like the hypnotic regression, it sort of allows it to be brought to light at a comfortable pace. Like trickles you, back in. <laughs> yeah, because you can kind of shine the light in the dark a little bit and then like sort of come back out of it and like sort of go in like and process. out. Yeah. And yeah. and help you process that more and help Dip you. Dip your feet in and then okay. Yeah. This one, happened. <laughs> one really interesting technique that he uses sometimes when people are like too scared to go forward. For example, I'm at the bottom of a ramp. The ship is right there. I'm at the bottom of a ramp. I know that I walk up that ramp next. Uh, but I know that it's very scary when I get up there. So I don't want to go up. I'm scared to go up there. I'm scared to have that experience because I know it's not good. What he might have me do is he would say, okay, you create, you create a spy, a secret spy. And I want you to have him. He, nothing can happen. You can't, he can't get hurt. You won't get hurt, but you can see what he sees, but you stay here and you're going to send him ahead, send the little guy ahead and he'll go look around and then he'll come back and tell you. And like, so he uses this wow. sort of like, sort of little disassociative trick to make them send a disassociated part of them into the ship wow. to get to some recon and then come back out and make them feel a little bit more comfortable about That's now so going clever. into the ship. Wow. Even though they do go into the ship because it already happened, right. but they're just not ready to do it yet. Right. But a part of them knows what happened up there. So they can, they're like, I'll take just a little bit of visual of it before I go in. I'm, I'm so curious what, <clears throat> like, the metaphysical implications of the fact that a mentally generated avatar of you can navigate and explore your own memories. The metaphysical implications of that, I, yeah. I wish I knew, like, yeah. What, because this, we are something that is beyond this, and that's an avatar of something, and this sure. is an avatar of something. Like, just speaking in the general terms of consciousness, we're, we're experiencing reality um, more than one time right now, on all, on all these different levels. And this is the level of reality that, like, this is just a category of the reality we're actually experiencing, right? We mm -hmm. exist on these other levels. We simultaneously exist as like a little avatar in 5D walking around our memories unbounded by time and space. What is that realm? Like, <laughs> where the fuck is that? Yeah. And how many is it? Five? Is it? Because Carl Jung and Edgar Cayce said that thoughts are the, are the physical objects of the fourth dimension. So is that fourth dimension, according to Jung and Cayce? Uh, that's our, that's a fourth dimensional avatar of us operating in the fourth dimensional space of our memory bank, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Me neither. Yeah. It sounds good, but. <laughs> something like yeah, that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's right, but uh, something like that. Yeah, many people have the sense that they are not, that like where they go is not, is not like that it's not here in, it's not three dimensions. Like they feel like they are going to a different dimension. They feel like they're not in this reality anymore. Many people yeah. feel that way. That yeah. like what they're experiencing can't, doesn't make sense where we live or something. Right. Um, uh, the, the, um, the kids, when they get abducted, they, they do also end up being shown uh, apocalyptic images pretty often as well. Wow. So they are sort of prepped for that from from kids typically um the the beings do also seem to be able to uh do different kinds of healings like uh like they they'll take people up when they're sick and like there's been there was a story of someone like was had pneumonia and like reached out to them to help and they came and they picked him up and they cured his pneumonia and they put him back and like they do seem to take people and heal illnesses. One person apparently was healed of paralysis, according to according to John, that he was taken up and he was cured of paralysis and he was put back and he says that's what happened. But 
Nobody really knows. Damn. Um, there was a... I wanted to read this quote. This was a... This is the the section is called "Some Implications of the Abduction Phenomenon." Uh, we can continue to try to make the phenomenon fit the world as we have known it, jamming it into a kind of Procrustean bed of consensus reality, or we can acknowledge that the world might be other than we have known it. Then we are free to see where our thinking leads us. I cannot discourage those who try to discover conventional explanations for the abduction phenomenon. I would only point out that as a clinician. I have spent countless hours trying to find alternate explanations that would not require the major shift in my worldview that I have had to face. But as I discussed in Chapter 2, and as I have tried to make clear in the case narratives, no familiar theory or explanation has come even close to accounting for the basic features of the abduction phenomenon. In short, it is what it is, though the ultimate source of these experiences remains a mystery. A great quote. Yeah. There are that is that is such a lucid thinker. Yeah, you can't you can't read that and just be like, yeah, this guy's just trying to spin a fucking story. No yeah, that is he, that yeah. is an absolutely crisp mind just being like, I don't want this to be true, but this is yeah, true. Like this guy's way that, too yeah. reputable, way too educated, yes. he didn't way trip, too serious. He didn't to not trip and to. fall into the head of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Right. <laughs> he's, he's brilliant. Hey. A, a a top level author and psychiatrist and administrator. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, this this guy's not He's bullshit. Also, yeah, officer. Like. Yeah, yeah, air force. Yeah, and the military thing. Yeah, I mm-hmm. forgot about that part too. That's so funny because that uh, there's something about the military that has this like stamp of like like well, that's very reputable. I was in the military. You know, yeah, there's something. It's, it's honorable. It's if you're a liberal, you got to believe him because he was a professor, and if you're a conservative, you got to believe him because he was in the military. Yeah, he fought for his country. <laughs> uh, his bases are all covered. <laughs> he's, you can't fucking ignore this guy. There were uh, a few connections to uh, other books and and like authors that we've read that I wanted to bring up. Um, he did. He did work with Jacques Vallée on this book, who wrote nice. *The Invisible College* and was also talked about a lot in *American Cosmic*. Yeah. Um, let me. This is a. It's about a page long, but this is a uh, about and then an a, about uh, what Vallée has to say about the beings, and then a little quote uh, from Vallée. Mm. So Vallée draws many analogies, and this is about the beings themselves. Valet draws many analogies to the worldwide sightings of non-human, shape-shifting, airily adept beings through, throughout history. These beings appear to mankind in thousands of different guises. They possess extraordinary powers and frequently aim to partake of and or take away something belonging to humans, desiring to communicate with or simply play with tricks on them. He concludes, The UFO occupants, like the elves of old, are not extraterrestrials, they are denizens of another reality. Vallée believes that abductees' interaction with aliens is a part of an age-old and worldwide myth that has shaped our belief structures, our scientific expectations, and our view of ourselves. He writes, The same power attributed to saucer people was once the exclusive property of fairies. Vallée draws parallels between religious apparitions, the fairy faith, the reports of dwarf-like beings with supernatural powers, the airship tales in the United States in the last century, and the present stories of UFO landings. He speculates broadly, and then this is the quote from Valet's book, it's either from Dimensions or Passport to Magonia, which were two books by by Valet that particularly um, looked at like the folklore connections with the UFO abduction stuff. So the quote is, Or should we hypothesize that an advanced race somewhere in the universe and sometime in the future has been showing us three-dimensional space operas for the last 2,000 years in an attempt to guide our civilization? If so, do they deserve our congratulations? Are we dealing instead with a parallel universe, another dimension, where there are human races living, and where we may go at our expense, never to return to the present? Are these races only semi-human, so that in order to maintain contact with us, they need crossbreeding with men and women of our planet? Is this the origin of the many tales and legends where genetics plays a great role? The symbolism of the virgin in occultism and religion? The fairy tales involving human midwives and changelings? The sexual overtones of the flying saucer reports? 
the biblical stories of intermarriage between the Lord's angels and terrestrial women whose offspring were giants. From that mysterious universe are higher beings projecting objects that can materialize and dematerialize at will? Are the UFOs windows rather than objects? There is nothing to support these assumptions, and yet, in view of the historical continuity of the phenomenon, alternatives are hard to find, unless we deny the reality of all the facts, as our peace of mind would indeed prefer. <laughs> That's so fire. It's so good. As our peace of mind would indeed prefer. Yeah, it's much like what he had to say about, like, look, I, I, I tried everything I could to not have to make this shift in consciousness, but shit, here I am. Yeah. Uh, he also has a quote from Richard Tarnas, uh, actually from Cosmos and Psyche, ten years before it came out. Really? Yeah, it was like, it's quoted as uh, Tarnas, comma, in progress. Like, it's not even a book wow. that's out yet, that's but, it's, cool. but it's about Cosmos and Psyche, because that was really the only cool. book that came out after it. It's from that. Uh, needless to say, none of this makes much sense within the modern worldview brought to us by Western science, whose governing assumption, in philosopher Richard Tarnas's words, is that any meaning the human mind perceives in the universe does not exist intrinsically in the universe, but is projected onto it by the human mind. To Tarnas, this complete voiding of the cosmos, this absolute privileging of the human, is perhaps the ultimate anthropocentric projection, the most subtle yet prodigious form of human self-aggrandizement, that's big words, and represents an intellectual hubris of cosmic proportions. This guy's an asshole. Why the fuck does he talk like that? <laughs> no, but I feel like what he's saying is like, you know when the... Uh... Copernican revolution happened, everyone's like, no, the Earth's in the middle, because we're important. We're us. We're the main character. Yeah. There ain't no fucking sun in the middle of our galaxy. Yeah. And it, this is that same sort of thing happening where it's like, it's just as insane to assume that humans are the living, conscious, intelligent organisms as it is to think that the Earth must be the center of the universe. Yeah. It's that same sort of thing that, that people do not want to have shattered. Like, yeah. Like, and two paragraphs I don't know later, if he uses, he uses got, the word Copernican. Two paragraphs later, but yeah. not in that paragraph. Well, where I learned about the the philosophical significance of the Copernican revolution was in the first chapter of Cosmos and Psyche, mm -hmm. and it really, really stuck with me because it's like, man, if we were all so convinced that the Earth was the center of the universe, let alone the galaxy, not that we knew the difference between those concepts... Mm -hmm. What do we assume now as absolute undeniable fact that is completely wrong? Like, it's just yeah. intimidating yeah, yeah, yeah. to think about. Well, God, we were so sure that we, I think we killed that guy. I was going to say, what's scary about that is that the people who came forward and trying to prove that we were not the center, uh, I'm pretty sure they were, like, persecuted. Yeah. So yeah. what's, you know, what's going to unfold as this alien stuff gets out more and more, like, we, like we've been seeing the sea air in the last couple of years, like I feel like we're on the cusp of more information being revealed. Yeah, and so it's like, like we're on the cusp of everything. What's what's gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess the aliens will be right. <laughs> That'll be the, maybe maybe they'll be the undoing. <laughs> yeah, that they need to repopulate the earth for. <laughs> I, I think maybe. that people would get along a lot better if we were more on the same page about the fact that there's things like this outside of our world to worry about yeah, because sure. like, how are we going to feel united as people until there's something to be the other? Yeah. I think it we was think we're Reagan. everything. So we have to divide ourselves because what are we going to just say? Everything is the same, right? Everything is a human and all humans are the same. That's boring, but all humans are the same because there's something radically different out there that we all know about. You know, there's, that's an opportunity for like, greater planetary unity and something yeah. to do because every yeah. we're so fucking bored we're like we already evolved all the way we already <laughs> took over the whole damn planet yeah we're just sitting around now as a species we need something like this yeah and uh, it seems like evolution is at the core of it like in these these beings want to evolve with they want to like co-evolve with us too yeah yeah and i i can't help but think that something I mean, if you if you look at a primate and then a human and then a gray, it 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 it, it <laughs> less, tracks less body hair, less mass. <laughs> yeah, bigger yeah. head, bigger brain, less physically strong. 
it it just sounds like they're doing the kind of science that we would be doing in a hundred years if we did just do science to make money and we did science to solve problems. Sure. Uh, that sounds like where. That sounds like our future. Yeah. Um, they sound like older siblings evolutionarily. Yeah. Yeah. They sound. They seem extremely wise, uh, and even without Valet's mention of it, uh, a lot of times they made me think of like the Tolkien elves. Like these sort of ancient, super wise things. And they're like coming here to try and show us the error of our ways. And to like, love comes up an awful lot. Love comes up a lot in these abduction experiences. And like in the... A kind of a cosmic agape love. Not like a... Something like I that. fuck with you in particular love, but like a force. Yeah. yeah, like a loving force that connects us all. Like they talk, they talk about things like that. And they talk about raising consciousness and like so many people oftentimes like so much of this came across and i think this was even talked about in in spiritual emergency i think ufos were brought up there but like so much of this sounds like shamanic initiation so much of this sounds like the shaman journey but instead there it's like happening through this odd system of being abducted forgetting and then have to go through the remembering of it yeah. What is also really interesting about that, and I meant to mention this earlier when we were talking about the hypnotism, the hypnotic regression happens weirdly easily. Like, it doesn't take much time. It doesn't take the amount of time it would typically take to get people into the mode of, like, being able to regress. Mm-hmm. It happens very quickly, which could be because they want it to. That, like, they want the memories to be recoverable when you're ready yeah. to recover them. They want you to remember. Oh, okay. When actually one of the, the title of one of the, the title of one of the chapters in here was, you will remember when you need to, which is what one of the aliens said to one of the people when they were giving them some sort of order. Wow. You're going to remember when you need to. <laughs> That's pretty dope. So it may be that they are, that they want people to end up remembering these things. Um, one more, one more person that we had, that we've talked about previously that, that, it didn't it necessarily didn't exactly come up here, but it couldn't help but be on my mind is uh, Dr. Gary Nolan, who was uh, he's in American Cosmic, but he's he has a, a pseudonym in that. He's the one that's not Tyler, the other guy that like a UFO researcher mm. that is featured in American Cosmic. He was an abductee and he like talked about his abduction experiences as a child. And a big part of the reason he's involved in ufology is because he wants to find a way to stop the abduction experience because he's he's sick of the way that they're treating us. So it was interesting because this book presents almost universal positive experiences uh, from the uh, from the aliens. Mm. Yet Dr. Gary Nolan uh, feels very negative about them, although he is he hasn't gone through hypnotic regression to my knowledge. Uh, he, I've never heard him mention it. At least I think he just wants to try and find a way to stop it. Although maybe he's too scared to try and go into that because he is scared. Yeah. It is very clear that he's scared. Um, the other reason Dr. Gary Nolan came to mind is because of his role in uh, the Sirius documentary and the Sirius being in a documentary by... I don't think I remember that one. A documentary by Dr. Stephen Greer. We watched it with Mason in like 2012. What's it called? Sirius. S-I-R-I-U-S. Okay. Uh, in it, he presents what appears to be an alien body. Right. It's like a foot tall. Yeah, I remember that. And it looks like a gray. It's the right proportions, even. But it's like a foot tall. So it's like it got shrunk down. Now, like a baby would typically be like a curled up, differently shaped being. With a big ass head. Yeah. Right. But it's it looks like a, a being shrunk down. Uh, Dr. Stephen Greer was, was um, presenting this as evidence that like, look, I, f- I found an alien. And it looks just like a gray. And uh, Gary Nolan was, is a, um, I can't remember his credentials, but he's very qualified to be doing like an autopsy on something and doing genetic uh, analysis. He tested it and he said, this is human. He said, this is human. There's a few um, mutations with it, but this is human. And it's, it's actually not that interesting. It's just kind of a weird mutation. Uh, and Stephen Greer was still hesitant about that. But... Uh, I am inclined, or I was inclined, to just believe Gary Nolan on that, mostly, because uh, I think he's more reputable than Stephen Greer. I, I totally agree. Like, mm-hmm. if this guy knows how to test the DNA on the thing, and that's what he says, then that's what he says. Yeah. But also, like, wait, there's a foot tall? 
human? That's still interesting, right? Why Very are we just odd. brushing over that and just going, yeah. well, oh, weird, that's a short what one. What if it was a hybrid the whole time? Though? Yes. So it does seem like it probably was. Yeah. Because when they, are, when they are brought into the room with, like, all the sort of tubes and uh, the aquariums on the wall with the fetuses in them, the fetuses do not look like fetuses. They look just like the being in Sirius. They look wow, like a gray. Exactly the same as a gray, but just shrunk down, like little action figures wow. in all of those in all those things. Mm. So it is that's compelling. It lines up with what Greer has. It lines up with the body wow. that Greer has. It could be, and it also explains why Gary Nolan said that like this is human, there's some odd mutations, but this is human. Because it's mostly human, but it's mixed in with whatever alien stuff. That well, seems that like a alien totally... may even share DNA with us if they did it like True. Right. Yeah, yeah, they may like if you so, test the degree, you may be like, This is basically human. Right. Yeah. So, this is human compared to I mean, if you're compared <laughs> yeah, right. if your worldview on DNAs is human category, <laughs> dog category. That's very true. Yeah, yeah, you'd fucking round up to human That's if yeah. you looked very at true. that. <laughs> yeah. So Gary Nolan came to my, my mind a couple times there, and I, I think that that is probably like Probably what they found. They're probably they're both right. It's kind of human, but it's not yeah. really. But so, it is, well, it, is really it was reasonable of Gary to say this is mostly human, but not reasonable to say it has some strange mutations and is only one foot tall. But that's probably nothing. That part is like, yeah. wait, that's a, that's kind that's, of a leap. Yeah, it's like how did we get here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what had to happen? For oh this well, to yeah, happen? I guess like, if it's just human with some weird mutations and it's only one foot tall, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to look that up, if you want to, it's Stephen Greer, alien. He's got a little, just like there's plenty, there's pictures and video yeah. of this little guy, and that sounds like basically what it looks like. Um, uh, it doesn't. We've talked a bit about the idea or the uh, evidence that there are beings that give technology to people in uh, altered states of consciousness, which is discussed a lot in American Cosmic. People go into certain uh, altered states of consciousness and they connect with something and they get an idea and then they come back and they make it and it works. It doesn't seem like they're the same. It doesn't seem like it's the greys because it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like they are ever interested in giving ideas or giving technology to any of the abductees. Could be a different department, though. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not them. Could just be a different operation they're doing. Um, but it does seem kind of at odds with their concerns environmentally that like, cause our further technology is not, is never helping the environment. Well, sometimes it is, but it's rarely helping the environment. Right. So, um, I'm thinking that it's probably, uh, probably two different groups. Uh, what, and then, uh, one more thing I wanted to highlight. One of the guys in this, interestingly, is a chi manipulation practitioner. One of the abductees is a chi manipulation practitioner, and his master said that because he went to his master, who's like a Zen Buddhist uh, teacher, and he told him about what was going on, and he was he explained that like, oh yeah, I mean like Buddhist. He said that something like that uh, Buddhist philosophy is very open to and acknowledging of the fact that there are other beings, and they are probably interested in you because of your particularly high energy levels. Um, not that there's a ton of weight on that, but I don't know how common chi manipulators are. But he was one of them, and he was getting abducted. Well, yeah. Um, I think that's everything I had to present there. Um, the So much of the stuff was uh, obviously, like, very spooky. But I was also really surprised to come out of this entertaining the possibility that these things aren't demons. That these things are not, like, inherently evil. And in the end of the book, he even says that, like, his conclusion is that uh, these things certainly don't seem to be evil. That everybody that comes into contact yeah. with them seems to come away from it. Uh, once they understand the interaction, they come away from it thinking, like, oh, this is good. And they're trying to help us. So there might be a group of beings that's, like, here, and they're kind of among us. But then they're taking samples of us, and they're trying to guide us in a positive way uh, towards, like love and connectedness and and uh environmental concern we gotta go talk to these guys well i don't, I don't know how you find them steven Greer method yeah yes yeah ce5 so 
also, like, I wish like, we could just get him to show up and, like, hey, <laughs> literally, you can come down here and, can t- like, literally, you could come down and we could talk right now. Like, <laughs> that would be I need so to, cool. Like, beg yeah. them to come hear something that they talked about. Like, yeah, maybe. Cure my, cure my vision. <laughs> they, yeah, they, I'm sure they could. Uh, I would love to talk to them. That would be very interesting. Right. Although I, I don't really want to talk to them unless they're going to be like, even, like it is. It is hard. It's kind of hard to stomach the idea that like these guys are totally good, when they are being so mean about the way they introduce themselves. And I guess that's because they probably had like, they, a lot of times they end up getting attacked if they don't immediately take control of the situation like that. Just like um, animal control. Animal control, they don't, I don't... We don't want to hurt dogs. Yeah. But the first thing we do is throw a muzzle on them. Yeah. Because, like, bro... Or tranquilize animals. Right. Yeah, or we yeah. shoot them with a dart. Yeah. Like, maybe it's that's how it is. Um, and that makes sense, because oftentimes people will report that, like, the greys, while they're being taken in, the greys are scared. The greys are, like, uncomfortable, because humans are wild and, like, unpredictable. Yeah. And they're weak. They, like, are physically weak. We could just pick up aliens like this and yeah. just bang them together. They're just skinny little guys. Yeah. And you you could pick them up and you could beat them in a fight, although you don't end up doing that because they have uh, emotional control over you. you too. Although they're still, like, they're still uncomfortable. Right. They're still uncomfortable and they're, like, spooked by being around people. Like we would be spooked being around uh, chimpanzee. Yeah. 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 So, in, in theory, I like the idea of doing the CE five protocol and um, talking to them if possible. But when I think about actually doing it, I realize I would shit myself. I would well, be. And the thing about the CE five is, you know, if there are obviously there are different. If I believe in aliens, I believe that there are different kinds of aliens, right? There's different species out there. Right. Just like it's not just us and one other. There's multiple. Mm-hmm. Doing the CE five, like it's sort of like uh, putting out. Um, you're just like putting out a message and hoping to get something in return. You don't know what's going to be close by and answer. You don't mm-hmm. know if it's going to be the same aliens. Yeah, but see, it's nice. it is yeah. possible though because I don't understand CE five entirely. But it's possible that it's not the same as just putting out an SOS to whoever. It could be that, like, you're putting it out because of the way that you're thinking, that you're putting it out at a certain frequency that only the things that you want mm-hmm. like, would end up getting the message. That's, that's possible, too, yeah. I According to Greer, what? there's never been a bad experience. Is something I can just Google real quick, the CE5 protocol? Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah that's, that'd be I, 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 really you know, I, I feel like I've had a hard time finding, like, a very clear-cut okay. um, version of it, although you can try. Um Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's made my perception of um, of aliens and uh, even the abductors, especially specifically, that like I, I don't know, I don't know anymore. They they might not be bad like I thought they were. There might be something. More, it might be complicated, and it, maybe if I totally understood their plan, I wouldn't even agree with it. And maybe these and, and John does sort of address this in the book that like maybe these people, it's it's like a. Uh, uh, what's the thing where you begin to um, empathize with your captor? Uh, Stockholm Yes, syndrome? it could be something like Stockholm, although John acknowledges that and says that like he doesn't have any of the hallmarks of that. It doesn't line up with yeah. what Stockholm well, then typically he would know. is. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. You find anything? Yeah. Pulled it up quick. By, by Ray Dove? Do you know him? No. Okay, well then, it might not be a legit one, but step one... Find a spot. Step two, prepare yourself for meditation somehow. Step three, meditate, state intentions out loud or inwardly. There's more details on here, but uh, step four, focus on your heart center. Mentally project your peaceful intentions and invitation out into the cosmos. Step five, scan the skies for ET crafts. So it does have something to do with uh, putting out a certain intention so that you hopefully, I mean, I'm not going to pretend to know how that works, but. Well, I would love I would love to do that, and I think I I feel like There's if, an app, St- Doctor Stephen. Green yeah, I've got a CE five app. Yeah, I've never downloaded it, but uh, I would I would, I would love to do that, and I I don't I think I would only shit my pants if I was alone. Like I think if someone else was with me, it's like, are you seeing that too? Like 
it would be that would be okay. Yeah. There's like meetups and stuff like that. You can go in large groups too. Right. Like there's yeah. a community. More I, people would be better, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, because you'd be putting out a stronger signal. I would think. I think that's how it I works. Think so yeah. So and also, you know, more people. I would be like scared. <laughs> totally. I was just learning in um, found, foundations of physics and consciousness that um, so there's there's two kinds of fields. I'll get into this at the end of class, but. There's, uh, I was talking earlier about quantum fields and how one field can give rise yeah. to matter or force. Well, there, that's not the whole story because there's forces that, that do specialize in, or there's fields that do specialize in either manifesting as matter or force. And the forces that manifest as, uh, the fields that manifest as forces are called boson fields. And the ones that manifest as matter are called fermion fields. So that's like, it, it's a really interesting yin yang, uh, example because it's, a, a quantum field, a, a type of quantum field that promotes diversity, and a type of quantum field that promotes unity. Mm -hmm. A type that promotes matter, and a type that promotes force. But anyway, I was saying that human consciousness acts as a boson field, as a force field, not as a as a fermion field. So, like fermion field would produce electrons. Electrons, you know, if you look at the structure of an atom, they're avoiding each other. Mm -hmm. But the nucleons and the protons, uh, they clump together. Human consciousness is like a force. It's like something that naturally clumps. And so when people meditate together, they achieve better results reliably. Because like if I turn on a flashlight, what you would see is a beam of light. But what's really happening is like a bunch of these little photons are, are grabbing each other and teaming up and attracting each other and building into a clump that mm. then appears as a beam of light. It's really a photon that said, hey, do you want to go play? Hey, do you want to go play? Hey, do you want to go play? And they, they all group together and blast like that. So I think I think that if you were in a group of people, it would be more like uh, a beam of light showing yeah. out into the universe than just like one photon just being like, beep, beep, beep. I think that, it would be a stronger signal. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of that documentary we watched. I, I can't recall the name of it, but basically there were studies done. Of the, the, the one about this? About the CE5? Was it the CE5 one? Maybe it there's was. A, there's yeah. a documentary called Close Encounters at the Fifth Yeah, Pine, this might be the same document. I can't this. remember if it was the same one. But basically they talk about a, like a large group of people in cities. They've been strategically placed in a city and they all meditate on the same things at the same time. And they've seen like they've been able to like reduce crime. Yeah. Yes, that like was that, that documentary. Um, yeah. it, it's just a matter of, you know, people, like having enough people. Yeah. Yeah. If if uh, there was I I can't remember how this these studies were done, but uh, when the number of people in a community practicing transcendental meditation hit one percent, uh, it started to affect the general behavior of the population in the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it went into. I'm not sure what else. There's like, I feel like we could pick apart any one of the any one of the many things that are going on with the beings um i don't have anything else specific to say me neither i guess let's leave it at that and we'll we'll keep looking into it and we'll we'll learn more later night school night school night school <laughs>